it's 2019 and we are back. Hey everyone, it's me, John Lorden. And me, Danielle Hallen. I hope you guys had an amazing new year and we are so excited to start 2019 out with you guys, literally on the day 2019 started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't believe this. Um, and thank you so much for all your support during last year. 2018 was just a really big year for me personally in terms of my channel, but also doing this work with Danielle, and we really appreciate having you guys out there supporting us. So thank you for being a part of that. It has been absolutely amazing. I want to thank you guys as well, because I know, you know, I had a huge change in my personal channel as well last year. I kind of really started growing a lot. And, you know, it's really when I started communicating a lot with John, and we both decided something like this was necessary for the both of us. We wanted something to do outside of our channel, something a little bit different. And, you know, another person to talk to occasionally. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. this has been absolutely awesome. And we are so thankful to be here. So thankful for you guys. So I'm so excited to see what 2019 brings. Um, and we know actually, something it's bringing. Yeah, one new thing that it's bringing. I am really, really excited to announce that we have merch now. Yay. Yay. I'm so excited. Uh, I actually have put a few things down already. Um, I had a question before I jump into it. There are a couple of items that I want to know if you guys would be interested in. They are phone cases. I think it's Samsung and iPhone all the way through. Um, but that was just something I wanted to throw out there because I personally would love a phone case, but... I wasn't sure. But right now, we have a mug, a crime after crime mug. You guys asked for it. The winner's mug. You can have your own. <laughs> you can. You can just constantly be a winner while me and John battle it out. Now, hold <laughs> on. If, if they get the full experience, they should have to put it away for a month. <laughs> you know what? That's true. And that brings another thing. I had a few people suggest we have a Team Danielle mug and then a Team John mug. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're interested in that, let us know. That way, you know, if I lose, you can lose with me. I know that doesn't necessarily <laughs> sound very pleasing. <laughs> it's the only merchandise that you buy that you can't actually use. That's right. We're, we're innovating here. Exactly. But that's okay because if one of us lose, if, you're, if your team loses, we can move on. And you can still wear your T-shirt. Oh. We will have premium T-shirts. We have premium sweatshirts, hooded sweatshirts. There's also a tote bag that you guys can get and awesome. stickers. Great. So you're covered from your car to your kitchen to grocery shopping to what you wear. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. <laughs> well, uh, if you do have suggestions about the merchandise, you can let us know about it at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod or drop it in the uh, comments down below if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, if you want to check out the merchandise that Danielle, by the way, thanks Danielle for putting all that together. Uh, she worked <laughs> really welcome. hard to do some really cool designs there. Uh, if you want to see it for yourself, head on over to Teespring, that's T-E-E spring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime, no spaces, just crime after crime. And you can see the merch there for yourself that is currently available and be sure to let us know. If there's some other stuff that you want to see in there. Send us a tweet, leave a comment in the YouTube video. We will get to that. Uh, also, visit the Twitter account at Crime After Pod to vote for seven days after this episode originally releases. So, for from January seventh to about, or from January first to about January seventh, you can vote at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod. Of course, you can also vote on YouTube, right, Danielle? Yes, you can vote on YouTube. I wanted to, again, clear a couple things up. I always have a timestamp of when you can vote in the video just in case you lose track. I also kind of say at the end of the video, hey, you know, now's your time to vote. Um, but a lot of people, for some reason, this past episode have confused the I. They're thinking I as in like E-Y-E. -E. Oh, <laughs> like someone's to, eye? Yes, like someone's eyeball. Okay. Um, <laughs> I haven't gone that far with that yet. It's <laughs> actually just the letter I. It should pop up, I think, in the top right portion of your screen. Um, if for some reason I'm off by a second or two, uh, just keep watching. I promise it's somewhere around the timestamp. It should show up for a couple of seconds. That, I think that's the trick with it. You really have to pay attention yeah. to the upper right-hand corner. Um, and it's not a very big letter I. It's, yeah. it's, it's even lowercase. And it, it yep. shows up, I think, in a little tiny circle in the upper right-hand corner. So you have to catch it and click it. Um, but 
just know that she has the time code in the description box below. So if you're watching up there and it's 30 seconds has passed by and you haven't seen it, go hit that link to the time code again. It'll jump back to the right spot and just keep your eyes in that upper right hand corner so you can find it and vote. And now for the voting results from last month's episode. Okay. <laughs> Here we so, go. What was last month's episode again? What was the topic? Um, worst motive to murder. And that one was a, I mean, that was an interesting episode. We yeah. both brought forward some really interesting stories. We just so happened to both cover crazy neighbors. Yeah. Which, I mean, as I've always said it, me and you are always on the same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm honestly not that surprised. Um, but you blew it out of the water. <laughs> so for <laughs> Twitter... Uh, I had 34% of the votes. You had 66%. Thank you. And on YouTube, I had 24% and you had 75%. So yes. You're, and what's you're... what's really interesting is there's 1% in there that I don't know who they voted for, but uh, the math there only comes out to 99%. So maybe, maybe they said both. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I know. I was thinking that earlier, but that, I mean, it's the numbers. Or maybe YouTube and Twitter are both very bad at math. I, I don't know. Either way, Someone's you know. bad at math, but yes. So where is it, Danielle? Where is my... Right here. Hand it over. There we go. Thank you There's so much. Mm -hmm. I'm Let me pretty just take... reluctant to give that over to you today. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. It's been bouncing back and forth across the country. I know. And a lot of people were actually saying they couldn't wait to see who would be the first person to win two times in a row. Yeah. Yeah. It's been going, uh, bouncing back and forth. And I'm wondering if it's coinciding a little bit with, you know, when we're picking episodes, we try to pick a little bit of a heavy one and then a little bit of a light one, a little bit of a heavy one, a little bit of a light one. So does this mean that you win the light topics and I win the heavier, darker topics? I don't know. There might I be think something to that. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I, I was even thinking about that earlier, and I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah. Well, and I'm also pretty sure you might win this one. So oh, I don't know. This it, is it a really <laughs> tough, this is a really tough episode. You guys have no idea. We were, yeah. we were even uh, trying to <laughs> consult each other during the research process. Like, are, are you okay over there? Because I'm not <laughs> feeling so good. <laughs> I know. I was looking into it. I couldn't find anything. And John was like, you know, wave your white flag. I've got some search terms for you if you need them. And I was like, I refuse. I'm yeah. doing this on my own and I might fail, but I'm going to try my hardest. Yeah. This this month's topic is crime committed. We originally called it crime committed in the name of good. Now we're calling it crime committed for good. But the tricky thing about researching that is kind of trying to figure out your entry point for what terms are you going to search on to try to lead you to the stories that reflect that? And there's so much that's kind of subjective about the term good. What exactly is good? And then, of course, you get the other side. Is there a crime that lines up, uh, you know, with that story? So it, it was a really tough researching job. But Danielle did not need the help I offered. I offered. I might wish I had taken it, <laughs> but I didn't because I'm stubborn. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I have a story, but as John said, it is very, very subjective. I am uh, terrified of the story I'm about to tell you. It's a good one. But I mean, it's definitely one of those subjective ones where a lot of people are probably like, this guy is crazy. This isn't for good. But it was probably the hardest research job I've had to do so far. Um, but I guess I'll just jump right into my story and hope for the absolute best. Let's do <laughs> Starting it. Starting the New Year's off with a good bang. I'm going to sit here with my mug and keep sipping on what tastes like victory. <laughs> it tastes so good. Sweet victory in this mug. We'll save some of it because honestly, you're probably going to need it for next time. <laughs> we'll see. All right, Danielle, let's hear it. Okay. So Mayor Sanchez Gordillo. He is referred to as the Spanish Robin Hood, and a lot of you might actually know about him. John, do you know about him? No, no, I don't. I'm not familiar. Well, he is the Spanish Robin Hood, uh, and for good reason. Again, subjective. Okay. <laughs> so Gordillo was the lawmaker and mayor of Marina Leda and the southern portion of Andalusia. So this is all happening in Spain. Mm -hmm. Now, the community that he is now the mayor of is known as a communist utopia. So he offers equal pay, communal land, other benefits. I'm pretty sure he offers housing to everyone. So everyone is given a home. They pay a very flat rate mortgage. 
Um, but it, it wasn't always that way. And this is kind of where the crime starts to build up and why it happened. So Gordillo was born into the community in 1949, and he recalls it as being one of the most miserable places to live. Marina Leda was not known as a good place. The village was made up of rural workers that were migrants, and there was a huge unemployment rate in the town at the time. So if anyone wanted to work, they had to travel. I'm talking not just a little bit. They would travel to Germany uh, pretty far out in order to have a job. So surviving was pretty much impossible. So he ended up growing up and starting a job as a high school teacher. So you can already kind of see he had a very compassionate and caring personality. And he became really tired of watching his entire community struggle. So he ended up turning into a political activist. Okay. Yep, we're getting going here. (laughs) (laughs) So after 12 years, I'm talking 12 whole years of hunger strikes to try to get better for his community, protesting, they would shut down airports, they would block off roads, they pressured the government constantly to give more land to the community. He was finally able to create his community and Marina Leda that he saw as being the best, which is the now communist utopia. So Gordillo really pushed against mainstream politics, if you haven't caught up on that already. Oh, yeah. And he always did what was best for his community. And in 2000 in Spain, 2000 in Spain. Yep, here we go. In 2012, (laughs) Spain was on the brink of losing everything. And from what I've seen, I don't think a whole lot has really changed. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So the nationwide unemployment rate in 2012 was at 25%. Wow. Wow. That's pretty high. Um, And if that's not bad enough, Andalusia's unemployment rate alone was 34%, meaning about one of three workers was unemployed. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of people. There was a lot of conflict going on between the community and the government. All of Spain was basically just in a huge crisis. So many workers at the time in this area left farming to go to the construction industry, thinking that was going to be so much better. And then they were forced out of the construction industry when it was in the middle of its collapse. And they tried to return back to their farming jobs and they couldn't get back to their farming jobs because there were none. And then the community, or not the community, but the government wouldn't let go of any of their extra land they weren't using to create more jobs for their people. So the government was kind of just sitting back and trying to fix their economy by, you know, crunching numbers. They were really ignoring a lot of advice from people. There were a lot of missed opportunities and their people were just starving on the streets. I think tens of thousands, I don't know the exact number, lost their homes. Tens of thousands of people were evicted. And when the housing uh, construction industry crashed, over 800,000 homes were left unfinished and unusable. Wow. So, I mean, it was a massive disaster. So, Mayor Gordillo took matters into his own hands because, after all, his communist utopia, Marina Leda, only had a 5% unemployment rate, which is a massive difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were flourishing in the middle of Spain that was just crumbling. But he knew that he wouldn't have a lot of people on his side, that he had a lot of out there ideas, (laughs) again, subjective. (laughs) Um, So he thought of more of short term solutions to help people and have his voice heard until he could be taken seriously. So his solution was to begin staging robberies at supermarkets. (laughs) Whoa, 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 whoa. What? (laughs) It? Oh, yeah. Well, with the 5% that were unemployed, he's sending them to supermarkets to rob them? So... In August of 2012, he led himself and his supporters on a week-long raid that hit several supermarkets in surrounding towns. Now, I'm not sure if he picked towns based on uh, economic status or, you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure how he chose these towns, but he led all of his supporters on this raid. And while he didn't technically enter these stores, he organized all the events and he stood outside directing 
all of his comrades using a megaphone as other activists cheered him on. So at each store, dozens and dozens of carts were filled with milk, bread, pasta, sugar, canned food, eggs, all your typical staples. And they would all just rush out of the store without paying anything. Yeah. Now, for for some reason, when I was going into this and thinking about it, I was picturing like a very peaceful event, as peaceful as it could be. Almost like a hit and run, like sneak in, get the stuff, and then just run out. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, these were big ordeals. Um, police would be there. Lots of screaming. I mean... It's looting, employee, basically. Oh, yeah. The employees were absolutely terrified. Um, and... I mean, he was. He was screaming into his megaphone. He was encouraging people. There were activists cheering and blocking police out of the way. Uh, and it was it's actually kind of scary <laughs> to watch. Yeah. Um, and multiple raids would occur every single day. And he vowed that if they would continue because someone had to do something. He was tired of the government sitting back and not helping their people. He was tired of watching his community starve and all of Spain starve. So... I'm talking they would fill up entire backs of trucks with food. Like they completely looted these supermarkets. Yeah. And he would take this food and distribute it to some of the people, some of the families that were hit hardest by the economic crisis. So you're seeing how like the Robin Hood is starting to kind of play here. Uh, and I'm talking big families, like families of six or more that didn't know what they were going to eat every single day. Um, if they were going to eat every single day, he would take it directly to these families. He would also take them to soup kitchens as well. So he helped restock almost all the soup kitchens that he possibly could because there was a huge in speak in speak. I'm having a hard time speaking today. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> they had a huge spike and increase in demand, and they couldn't feed all these people that were coming in. It was taking away from, you know, the other people that had originally gone all the time. So he helped restock everything. And what I found most interesting about this is that because of his position as an elected parliament member, mm -hmm. he had political immunity. Oh, wow. So he couldn't even be technically arrested for his crimes now i don't know if he thought by not going in the store that would help him even more but he was still staging and organizing these events and yeah, yeah we so have we have charges here in the u.s of like inciting others to riot yep. you could be charged with that so i would imagine they have some equivalent law in spain i don't know for sure but i would imagine that just the fact that he's enticing those others to do that, to go and to perform those actions. I mean, it's essentially like saying you have a crime boss somewhere and just because he's yeah. not the guy that's smashing and grabbing the diamonds doesn't mean he's not Still responsible. Part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, he, I mean, and that's not even the only thing he did. Those went on for a week. He had a whole bunch of different marches. I think he did a three week long march as well. There was a portion in time where he got all of his activists together mm -hmm. and they slept on government land. I think it was uh, the Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense. Yeah. They had 3,000 acres and they were just sitting on it. They weren't using it. There was nothing happening with it. And so they illegally trespassed, went onto this land. They slept there forever. And his whole purpose of doing that was he wanted to take it over to create more farmland because all these people that had lost all their jobs moving from farming to construction and then trying to go back to farming, he wanted their jobs back. Yeah. And this land could have been used, but the government wouldn't really give it up. Um, so yeah, but his political immunity really didn't help him all that much because I've seen that he said he would actually step down. He said, you know, if you want to arrest me, fine. I'm stepping down, but I stand by what I did. I helped and fed and kept alive thousands of people. Uh, and he said, you know, the only thing that's going to happen from you arresting me is that you're going to spread my message further. You're going to, you know, show all <laughs> these other people martyr. yeah, throughout Spain that there's someone else that cares about you and will take care of you. And I think he was arrested total somehow about seven times. I don't think he ever stepped down. I think they just kind of detained him. Um, I did see at one point he was, he was in jail for about seven months. Because of this uh, language barrier, I wasn't really able to look into as many articles as I would have liked, but mm. he did all of this for the greater good of his community. You know, you hit on a really important point when you were talking about it, about how did he choose the locations that he was hitting? Because even in the, you know, if we're calling it the Robin Hood excuse, it's about 
taking from the rich specifically to give to the poor. Exactly. If you go and rob from a store that is family owned business, that is quite a bit different than, you know, uh, going and hitting some type of government facility and taking a bunch of resources from there and then distributing them to private citizens. So exactly. And that's, I think the government was obviously completely not on his side with this. And, you know, they said one thing, the interesting thing that they brought up was how could you call yourself a Robin Hood, but still be getting money from the government because of your position. Mm. So, I mean, there, this is what I'm saying about subjective. Yeah. And again, I couldn't find out enough information about the exact stores that he hit, you know, were they in more well-off neighborhoods, more well-off towns? Like I, it's, whew, yeah. it's wild. It is. It is. Um, it's strange because there's aspects of it that I, I respect. I mean, obviously if, if you have people starving, you want to do something to try to, to try to stop that, to try to help them with that. Um, and for him to be in that type of, of a position where he probably could have just laid low and not taking yeah. any big action like that and, yeah. um, you know, wouldn't have gone through some of the stuff he's gone through. I mean, no one wants to spend even seven months in prison, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a strange one. And you're right. It's the subjectiveness of the term it good. Is. But if you are actually living in that environment and you have families coming to you because you're in that position and, you know, you're looking at children that are starving – it might move you to to take some pretty drastic actions. So, yeah, and that's what's so crazy to me is I, I feel like he has so he has so many supporters, <laughs> yeah. so many supporters, and all of those people believe that he's helping, and you know they think this is all for good. And I, I'm wondering if they think they're only affecting the government by doing this. I don't know. This is where you know you could keep going when it comes to being subjective, but yeah, man. But then you think about the people who you know maybe can't get groceries from those grocery stores now. So maybe they're not eating now. Right. It's, I don't know. This is what I'm saying when, you know, this research job was hard because there's not a lot and everything is so subjective that mm -hmm. to someone else, that could be the worst thing anyone's ever done. Right, right. Uh, in a strange way, we actually kind of aimed similarly in terms of what we were, what, what we tapped on. And I actually found a term, and this is the thing that, I was going to tell you to search on if you needed to. It's called the necessity defense. Ooh. And uh, we're, we're going to read some information here about it. I think it applies to your story. Certainly applies to my story. Might actually apply to your story even a little more. So let's learn about the necessity defense. According to lawshelf.com, necessity can be used as a defense that permits a person to act in a criminal manner when an emergency situation, not of the person's own creation, compels the person to act in a criminal manner to avoid greater harm from occurring. So I can a, see that, yeah. Yeah, in a nutshell, people are going to die if he doesn't do this criminal act. So he does a criminal act to stop people from dying. Seems mm -hmm. seems kind of logical. The yep. free the freedictionary.com states that although no federal statute acknowledges the defense, the Supreme Court has recognized it as part of the common law. The rationale behind the necessity defense is that sometimes, in a particular situation, a technical breach of the law is more advantageous to society than the consequences of strict, ad strict adherence to the law. The defense is also often successfully in cases that involve a trespass on property to save a person's life or property. Uh, it also has been used with varying degrees of success in cases involving more complex questions. I think that, once again, that points to your case. Yeah. There are three primary components to using the necessity defense. Number one, the defendant acted to avoid a significant risk of harm. Number two, no adequate lawful means could have been used to escape the harm. And number three, the harm avoided was greater than that caused by breaking the law. So especially number two coming into effect oh, yeah. with, with yours as well, uh, because the government was not responding. Exactly. Yeah, I'm telling you, and I feel like that could actually relate to a lot of situations I've been in in my life personally. <laughs> that might sound crazy. No, but I think I had one in particular, I think it was a car accident. And yeah. I probably could have used that. I had to do things that probably aren't legal to try to get around a car to avoid an accident 
an accident ended up happening anyway, so I probably would have lost. But still, I yeah, no, but I I do I completely get how that does relate to my case and a, a lot of situations that I can see. But I feel like it's kind of like the sleepwalking defense, mm-hmm. where you can almost claim you had to do something, right? But it might not have been necessary. Yeah, and that's really what's important is that you need to prove that you really had no other option. Um, and that's where that statement about the government and really not responding to all the poverty that was yeah. going on uh, shows that there was no other course. It's not like he could have gone and made a presentation to them and you know changed their minds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that is certainly an important component to it. So let's roll into my story, the story of a man named Samuel Lovejoy, and in another way, kind of lines up with yours because. Uh, It's a little bit more about a crime that is trying to affect a political issue. Uh, So let's let's go ahead and roll with this. Montague is a town of just over 8,000 residents in Massachusetts with a very interesting history. One of the first canals in the United States was built there. However, as other routes became established and transportation options expanded, the Turner Falls Canal was eventually converted for power production and mill use. Montague seems to have a history of projects that just don't quite get to their intended goal, but it appears that was unknown to employees of the Northeast Utilities Company. In 1973, they zeroed in on Montague to build a nuclear power plant there. NU promised to invest over $1.5 billion into the area, which was over 30 times what the entire town was actually worth. They would build a double reactor nuclear power plant and all the support structures and services to go with it. The struggling town would finally have a solid and future-proof economy. And you promised that jobs and businesses would grow in support of the power plant and Montague would finally have the financial stability the area had been seeking for nearly a hundred years. Before the federal government would license the site to have a nuclear reactor built, and you had to conduct certain surveys. One of them, was monitoring weather and wind conditions for 365 consecutive days. They built a 500-foot-tall meteorological tower and began collecting data. Things seemed to be moving along for NU and their power plant. There was only one small thorn in their side. About four miles away from where the reactor was to be built lived a farmer and writer named Samuel Lovejoy who was with a group of organic farmers that had banded together and called themselves the Nuclear Objectors for a Pure Environment, or (laughs) N-O-P-E. Nope. (laughs) Nope. That is catchy. Yeah, I like that. That's catchy. (laughs) He had been eyeing that tower for the better part of a year. And on George Washington's birthday, February 22nd of 1974, he decided he was going to take action. Around 2 a.m., he took some tools and got in his truck. He drove over to the tower, loosened some of the bolts and turnbuckles on the tower, and connected a chain from the tower to his truck. Within moments, the 500-foot tower was ripped into a pile of twisted metal, and the 365 consecutive days of data collection required for federal licensing had been stopped before it could be completed. Sam didn't try to run or hide from what he had done. He went to a nearby road and planned to hitchhike into town to head to the police department and tell them what he had done. Interestingly, one of the first vehicles he encountered on the road was a police car. He oh was taking. <laughs> I know. What are the odds, right? Although th- this was around four o'clock in the morning at this point, so who else is out? You know. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Um, he was taken to Turner's Falls Station and met with Officer Donald Cade. In a statement that Lovejoy gave, he said. As a farmer concerned about the organic and the natural, I find irradiated fruit, vegetables, and meat to be inorganic, and I can find no natural balance with a nuclear plant in this or any community. There seems to be no way for our children to be born or raised safely in our community in the very near future. No children, no edible food, what will there be? While my purpose is not to provoke fear, I believe that we must act. Positive action is the only option left open to us. Communities have the same rights as individuals. We must seize back control of our own community. Through positive action and a sense of moral outrage, I seek to test my convictions. So, I mean, he he was ready. This yeah. wasn't like a spur of the moment, you know what? 
I'm tearing it down. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he went in with a plan. Yeah. <laughs> he knew it was hopefully going to work. As we'll I see. looked into this, uh, this is a guy that he read a lot about nuclear energy. He was a, he's, is a very smart man. Um, he's actually a lawyer at this point also. Oh, wow. Um, but, yeah, and you know this was going on. I don't know how much of the year was actually going on with the monitoring, but he had months and months of staring at this, and he knew enough about that process that if he exactly. broke, yeah, if he broke the 365 day cycle of monitoring, that at least at a minimum would push everything back out another year because they'd have to restart that, which uh, gave him more time to do more research and then figure out another plan. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, so since he was a longstanding citizen, they actually released him from jail. Uh, they didn't, you know, didn't he didn't have to pay bail or anything like that. Uh, he was charged with destruction of personal property, which carried a maximum five-year jail sentence. He immediately declared he was not guilty and stated he would represent himself in court. Uh, so is this why he went on to be a lawyer? Uh, it might be. It might be. Uh, we, we won't spoil the ending, though. He might, okay. he might lose still. I'll stop <laughs> asking questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Northeast Utilities claimed that he caused $100,000 worth of damage. I've seen a few different numbers. But their lawyers were basically saying it was $100,000. I think the actual numbers on building that tower was more like 42000 or something around there. Initially, the community was outraged at Samuel's actions. In a local paper, Sam was compared to John Wilkes Booth and even Adolf Hitler. However, letters started pouring in. People said they were inspired, and some didn't even know that a power plant was being built until after his vandalism. Soon, neighboring towns were joining together against the power plant, However, in Montague, at a town meeting where a vote came up to ban the power plant, it was shot down 67 votes to 12. Soon, NOPE formed a political party called the No Party, and several of its members, including Lovejoy himself, became candidates and ran for various positions. Although they didn't win, they did take a significant portion of votes and saw that the opposition to the power plant was steadily growing. And it was starting to become a statewide and even nationwide topic. Wow. In September of 1974, six months after he took the tower down, Samuel was now representing himself in court on the destruction of personal property charge. But he did hire a legal advisor to sit at the table with him, a man named Harvey Silverglate. Harvey would go on to write about his involvement in this case in Forbes magazine in 2014 he states that Lovejoy and himself lined up several experts on atomic power generation and several environmentalists to speak to the necessity of Lovejoy's civil disobedience. Lovejoy also took the stand to defend himself and spoke for six hours. I like this man. I do too. <laughs> Whether I agree with him or not, I like him, man. He, he knows what he believes in. He knows what he stands for and he pushes it. Yeah, and, and it, yeah, exactly. He's really willing to put it to the test. Um, one of the things that he also said in his statement was that if you got together 12 experts that really knew about uh, atomic power, that you would never get them to agree that it was safe to put in this community, that there yeah. is inherent risks. And if we look at the history that has happened uh, since this, you know, Chernobyl happened after this, Japan happened after this. Yeah. Um, and w with Chernobyl, I was looking into some information there. They're still trying to cover it up because they initially covered it with concrete. Now that's gotten to the age where it's deteriorating. And now they've just put a whole new cover over the concrete tomb of where Chernobyl is. So it's, it's one of those things that when, when issues happen with this type of power generation, it can it's affect a forever thing. <laughs> exactly. It affects the environment yeah. for tens of thousands or even longer years. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. So several jurors stated that they were moved by Lovejoy's words, and an initial poll was showing a hung jury. But there was a bit of a twist that was still going to come from the judge, Judge Smith. The judge, whom Silverglate describes as legendary with a kind of rural folk wisdom, was Kent Smith, a visionary who, as an attorney, would represent criminal defendants that had no means to represent themselves 10 years before the Supreme Court mandated that all states provide attorneys to these type of, types of clients. Oh, wow. Judge Smith removed the jury from the courtroom and then explained why he was dismissing the charges. The DA had charged Lovejoy with destruction of NU's personal property, which could be a maximum of five years in prison. 
However, in Massachusetts law, because the tower was anchored to the ground, it was not personal property, but real property. Lovejoy even provided proof that real estate taxes were paid for the tower during the presentation of his case. Destruction of real property is at most a six-month misdemeanor. Lovejoy begged the judge not to dismiss the case. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is a character. I would love to meet him. Seriously. Well, and he was wow. trying, you know, he was trying to put it on a bigger stage, yeah. essentially. He had this argument that he wanted the public to really make the decision about. And he had his jury. He, he knew the actions to get to this point. And now you've got the judge coming in and saying, you know what, we're just going to drop this because they've got you on the wrong charge anyway. And he's like, wait a minute, no, that's not part of my plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's, do this. he's literally begging the judge not to dismiss it. The judge replied with a lecture about the law that concluded with the statement, justice is justice is justice is justice. Which I don't know, Daniel, but I know you've looked into enough cases, and I have too, and sometimes what we think is justice is not what actually happens in those cases. Yep. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what we have going on in this case, especially from Samuel's point of view. In truth, during this entire process, the public support had swayed significantly in Lovejoy's favor. Even the DA decided not to appeal or refile any charges against Sam. Three days before the trial ended, the Alternative Energy Coalition ordered 21 of America's 50 active nuclear plants to be shut down for an emergency safety check after a crack was found at one plant. Within 60 days, all of those plants would be permanently shut down, as well as six additional plants in Japan. It is the largest shutdown in the history of atomic power. In 1975, Samuel Lovejoy made a film called Lovejoy's Nuclear War, the first movie on the anti-nuclear movement. Northeast Utilities initially said it would continue with the project, but they had to delay it for a year, obviously. Uh, later, they said they had to delay it again for four years. And with the public's perception of atomic energy radically changing, in 1980, they finally completely canceled all plans to build nuclear power plant. Samuel Lovejoy continued working with several protest and awareness groups and helped organize the five-night Madison Square Garden benefit concerts for a non-nuclear future, which was also released as a film called No Nukes. He eventually became a lawyer and occasionally speaks about his past and energy's future. When asked about why he chose George Washington's birthday to do this, Lovejoy stated, I'm sure George is up there in heaven smiling down and saying, that's solid. Oh my, <laughs> this man. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so that I is have Samuel no words Lovejoy. For that. Yeah, yeah. John, that wins by a landslide. Oh, uh, we that don't know. It's so. <sighs> it's, it's another, it's, it's interesting because we've got the same thing going on. What is your perception yeah. of good? And I believe that even currently, there's probably people that are going to hear this story and say, whoa, this guy is basically, you know, working against progress and working against technology. It's, it still comes down to a bit of your belief system in terms of what's good. But I think what we can all appreciate about him uh, is how he is as a person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. His, he's he's holding to his convictions. Yeah. He didn't try to hide or run away from what he was going to do. Uh, and then even when the judge wanted to dismiss it, he didn't want to let that happen. He really believed in the power of the people, um, which even in your story, we have that element kind of happening yep. as well. The people yeah. should be most important. And sometimes we get these things turned upside down. And occasionally someone has to stand up and be willing to do something to try to get things turned right side up again. So, yeah, even if you don't necessarily agree with his politics or his belief on nuclear technology and energy, the way that he went about this, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, yeah I am incredibly impressed. And then he just continued going on and doing great things, becoming yeah. a lawyer. I mean, that's an impressive person, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Really, really smart man. Um, and, you know, he knew what he was talking about. He did his research and he was willing to run it all the way, put his, put, you know, put his freedom on the line for it. Exactly. Which is the one thing that I think is lacking in my story. I think, I think that Gordillo was willing. He said he was willing to step down, 
But there are some instances there where I kind of I kind of question that he was hiding behind political immunity. He wouldn't actually go in and do anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know if maybe he figured the second he went down, everything went down. But I think what this guy did was very commendable, in yeah. my personal opinion. Yeah, it's it's a little bit different because in in your case, you have a man where he might have needed to be in that position to do those types of things. Yeah, in order to do that. Yeah, exactly. If if this was a farmer that was organizing those types of raids on the stores, guy would have been locked up, would probably still be sitting in prison. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different situation, Yeah. but, um, yeah, I really, I just like how Samuel's approach was with all this. And, uh, yeah, seems like a little bit of a likable guy, uh, maybe a little bit of a hippie. I really didn't have any sense of that when I was doing my research. <laughs> but uh, then that's solid. Until, Kenneth. yeah, until that's <laughs> solid, man. I could see him like as he's breathing out after taking a hit. Whoa, yeah, George Washington could say that's solid. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you saying it that way makes it so much more hilarious. I yeah. love it. Yeah, someone needs to check what he's growing on his farm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that, but honestly, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Danielle. So any other cases? Did you bump into anything else while you're looking through any of this that you wanted to talk about? There's a real obvious one that I can think of, but I wanted to see if you had anything first. Oh, no. You, like I like I said, the second we even got, before we even started recording, you whooped my butt in this one. I knew you were going to. I knew it. The second you told me you had a search term, I was like, forget it, man, because I've been searching the amount of of different things that I typed into my search bar. Oh boy. First of all, hopefully no one ever looks at my Google history. (laughs) And second of all, I came up with nothing. I'm so sad. I found a couple of things, but I really wasn't very impressed with them. And it was more so a crime that happened that had very bad intentions behind it that just turned into something good. So a crime strictly done for good from start to finish, This is literally one of the only ones that I found was my story about Gordillo. That's it. I kept running into stories about like justifiable homicides. And yeah, the other thing I was running into and I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. That's kind of where I was. I was like, you know, and we, we had just come off an episode of, of talking about murders and, uh, I, I just thought that I wanted to change it up a little bit. So I omitted those results basically, but I did bump into a couple Uh, of other situations that might just explain um, the definition, the necessity defense a little bit better. There was one case in particular where a man was drunk and he was hanging out with his friend who was also drunk. If I remember right, the friend, I think he fell through a window or out of a window, injured himself Mm. really badly. They were locked out of the apartment that they were both hanging out at. There was nothing that the drunk man could do except drive his friend to the hospital or his friend was going to die. But the man was drunk. So essentially his charge got dropped with the necessity defense. They said, you know, because if he would have stayed there, they had no other actions they could have taken, which I kind of question a little bit. I'm like, hey, couldn't you have, you know, tried to pound on a neighbor's door? Taxi or... Yeah, you might not want to wait for a taxi if your buddy's bleeding out, but in terms of getting help in some other (laughs) way... another option. Yeah, Danielle, if I'm bleeding out, don't wait for the taxi. Let me just make that clear right now. I'm like, don't worry, John, the Uber we're getting in 30 minutes. (laughs) You can't trust from this is don't trust me if it's a serious situation. Well, yeah. I, oh yeah. my goodness. And you, you can't trust those time frames on Uber or Lyft all the time either. But uh <laughs> so I, I kinda get that one. You know, the guy was he didn't know what else to do. He put his injured friend into the car and he drove drunk to the hospital to to get him the treatment. Um there was also a case of medical necessity where uh this came from Forbes also. The Washington Court of Appeals ruled that Samuel Diana may have had sufficient grounds to break the state's anti-marijuana laws in order to relieve the symptoms of his multiple sclerosis. So essentially. Interesting. Yeah, medical necessity can also come into play there. But the case that really stood out to me when I started looking into this aspect and thinking about it, especially on a political level, the Rosa Parks case. Oh, yeah. 
I am shocked. I didn't even like think about that. Yeah. And if, if, if it wasn't such a well-known story, I probably would have covered it. But I would like to hope that everyone that's listening to this podcast is very familiar with the Rosa Parks case. If you want a brief synopsis on it, uh, there was an episode of Doctor Who that was just about this case that happened this season as well. Um, but, you know, uh, what she did, certainly breaking the law, but for the greater good. Absolutely. Yep. I think uh, I don't think there's a, a case that actually fits it much better than the Rosa Parks case. Oh, yeah. No, I don't think so either. Um, I find it interesting that we were kind of both on that same playing field, though, of, you know, kind of really going against what someone wants, like not necessarily the government in your story, but, you know, really standing up for something that's going to affect a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you're just one person and you just kind of go for it, hope for the best. Um, but I find it interesting that we both chose stories like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's weird that we wound up the same way, even though I didn't give you that search term and we've kind of had this happen on previous episodes. Like, you know, last episode we had the neighbors kind of lining up the crazy neighbors here. We're, we're having, uh, people acting for the greater good essentially. So, or at least what they believe is a greater good. Exactly. Again, subjective. (laughs) It's made this very (laughs) difficult this month, but it's been very interesting. Yeah. And that leads me into saying, who do you vote for to win this month? I think I said it last time. I don't know if it was the time before I 100% vote for John's story. I vote for him in either way. I do. But I, I vote for Danielle every single time. So I mean, that that was another really good one, just like last month's. I loved that. I loved what this man was standing for. I loved that he was there to protect his people. He wanted kids to eat, you know, food that's not been touched by radioactive material, radiation, all sorts of things. So yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. But I'm going to go ahead and say right now, stop everything you're doing. The I is up in the corner. It's not an eyeball. It is the letter <laughs> I. Look at it. You, I can see it. Exactly. You just click that I and you will have the poll. You can vote for either John even, there or we're, myself. There yeah, we go. I'm pointing to it now. There. Way over there somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see how this one comes out. Could we possibly have our first back-to-back victory or is it going to swing the other way? I really have no idea. I'm really bad at anticipating what you guys are going to do in terms I, of voting. I feel like we're both that way. I honestly <laughs> do, but I'm telling you right now, I think you've got this one. You're going to, you're going to win again this time, which that's fine because then I just have to really kick my button to gear next time. Take your advice and help if you <laughs> offer it because I struggled this time. I knew it was a tough one. It was a really, really oh, tough one. So um, we have a little bit of a special extra for you guys here. Before we announce what next month's episode is going to be, there was several of you out there that were trying to raise our attention to a specific instance, a specific article. I think you guys think it would fit really neat into crime after crime. So Danielle doesn't know about this. I'm going to tell her a little bit about this instance right here, right now. We're talking about this is in March of this of last year, 2018, two Florida men are accused of breaking into their ex-boyfriend's home. Derek Irving, 36, and John Silva, 28, were arrested after allegedly breaking into the home and stealing several items, including a flat-screen television, window air conditioning unit, and a vacuum. I know. Very specific odd things, but I mean, you know, my vacuum's broken. Yeah. Would I possibly take my exes if I were mad? I'm not going to answer that question. I'll let you guys figure that out on your own. Well, Maybe, I think, I think you're I'll touching say. on it there. It's the whole ex, <laughs> ex-boyfriend thing that I'm wondering about too. Like I'm wondering about when they were with him. First of all, were all three of them together at the same time? Which is possible. This I don't know. Is, yeah. I've, I've been trying to figure that wording out as well. They don't make it very clear. <laughs> no. Uh, and this is from KTLA.com, uh, Channel 5 in uh, California. Uh, channel I used to watch all the time out there. But uh, so, yeah, I'm wondering about the ex-boyfriend stuff. And did they buy these things and they thought that it was really theirs and they're just going in there now to recollect it or something? You know, I think we've all had those relationships where the ex said that something actually belonged to them way after, you know, the breakup oh, happened. Yeah. Uh, the victim called 911 after being alerted by security cameras of motion being detected in the house He said a towel had been placed over one of his security cameras. The arriving deputies saw a red SUV leaving the area and they conducted a stop. The two men were inside the vehicle and they said they were just picking up clothes from the home. One of the men was wearing a bull costume. (laughs) (laughs) 
Now, if you're going to <laughs> rob an ex's place, I, I get that you might want to put on a disguise, particularly if you know that he's got some home surveillance going on. But a bull costume? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, but that's not all. <laughs> that's not all, Danielle. Um, the men initially denied the burglary, but when authorities went to the home, they found a burning pot of ragu sauce and a washcloth near the stove's burner, which appeared to be there in an effort to start a fire. So you're meaning to tell me that they planned to burn this ex's house down with pasta sauce? Yes, yes. <laughs> John, I don't know, but I think that might kick wasabi pants out the window. That's, And I think that's why everyone was sending it to us. Yeah, I received it from a lot of different people. Um, yeah, that might beat wasabi pants, especially being in a bull costume, trying to use pasta sauce to burn down your ex-boyfriend's house. Like, I don't understand. Again, it's, it's like wasabi pants or they're like, oh, we need to start a fire. Like most people are thinking matches or gasoline or gasoline. And they're like yeah. pasta sauce. Yeah. Pasta sauce. What do we got around here? We got it's pasta sauce. I mean, oh, honestly, even if you're in the kitchen, like use oil or, you know, something. I but... know, but pasta sauce? Yeah. yeah. Ragu sauce? And then again, what is up with the costume? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to figure out, I mean, where that was necessary. I mean, I, you're right, I guess, trying to not really give yourself away, but you're going to be a lot more alarming if you're dressed up as a bull. Seriously. At least in my personal opinion. I wonder if it's like a personal reference to the boyfriend in some way, if they knew that he was going to watch the footage and see them on it and, you know, they had some nickname or they argued about something, something weird where a bull would make sense to only him. But unfortunately, this article doesn't go into that. He does give a theory about the pasta sauce, though. Oh, he, man. Um he believes that they were trying to make it look like he had left the stove on. But his explanation is, but who gets up at 2 a.m. and fixes Skeddy? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I probably would if I was hungry enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even call it Skeddy, so I don't... <laughs> I know that throws me off, but I've been thrown off so many times in this story that I'm trying to not let that get super under my skin. Yeah. But I can see that. Try to make it look like he left the stove on. But yeah. Uh... Yeah. But I just, I don't see the place catching on fire. I mean, even if you've got a towel, you know, next to the burner, I mean, I guess if that was close to some curtains or something, you could, you could start some trouble. But anyway, both <laughs> men were charged with unarmed burglary, grand theft and arson. Uh, and they should have charged them with, <laughs> dressing like an idiot as well for the bull uh, costume. Yeah, exactly. Which leads us into our next episode, which is a very, very long weighted episode. People, yeah. I think, were just asking and suggesting this in our last one. The next episode is going to be the craziest costumed criminal. Yes, finally. This is one that Danielle and I have been talking about since originally talking about this show to start with. So I know. I think we both wanted it to be the first one, but we also, you know, wanted to save it for a good special time. And I'm telling you, I'm so excited. Yeah. But honestly, I think John and I will probably both find such ridiculous criminals that are dressed up that I don't know how either of us is going to win. Oh, I know. On Brain Scratch, I've already <laughs> covered stories involving clowns. Uh, mm -hmm. Santa Claus and I believe also um, St. Patrick's or uh, Leprechauns. I think I've covered those costumes already. So I'm going to try to reach for a story that I haven't covered before. Um, but yeah, craziest costumed criminals. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a really interesting episode, especially if we can find anything half as interesting as that a ragu bull. burning bull story. That we just ragu covered. burning bull. I'm forever going to remember that. <laughs> It's burnt into my memory now with the Pretty pasta much. sauce. Exactly. <laughs> um, also, we like to uh, share with you guys when we find a podcast that we like. There's another one that I've used for a long time in terms of research, uh, particularly for missing persons cases. But he actually does more than just missing persons cases. He kind of hits unsolved mysteries all over the place. Uh, the host's name is Robin Warder. It was really cool to meet him at CrimeCon last year. And his podcast is called... 
the trail went cold and I'm holding up a sticker that he actually sent me with his podcast graphic right there for all you guys. I'm also a patron of his. So obviously I endorse his work. Um, He's really good at research. If you are a fan of my work and how deep and Danielle's work and how deep we get into the research, he's really in that same vein. No overproduction in terms of his podcast. You're not going to hear goofy special effects or anything that pulls you out of the story. Very respectful, uh, very detail-oriented, and I just really appreciate his approach. So I wanted to let you guys know about The Trail Went Cold by Robin Warder. Be sure to check that out if you're looking for some more podcasts to spend some time with. And if you want to see more of John and I, we both have our own YouTube channels. You can check me out on Danielle Hallen. I talk about missing persons cases, all different types of true crime. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Danielle Hallen. You can find me on YouTube at the Lord and Arts channel. That's L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. Or you can search on my show title, Brain Scratch. Outside of that, you can find me at Twitter at Lord and Arts. Finally, uh, if you guys have ideas you want to submit for future episodes, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or come to Twitter, follow us at crimeafterpod, send us a message there. And if you've got a good idea, it might become a future episode. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to give a massive thank you to our patrons. They allow us to have limited ads on YouTube and no ads at all on the audio version. Plus, our patrons get a bonus Patreon special segment every single month. And we really dive deep into some interesting topics. You really get to see a strange and weird side of us sometimes. (laughs) John always finds the best questions that pull out the best stories in me. So if you're interested in that, definitely consider checking out our Patreon Plus, every single patron gets a special personalized shout out on the Patreon specials. So we have a blast over there. Definitely something that I recommend. And it really helps us keep this show going in the best way we can possibly have it going, which is without ads. (laughs) Absolutely. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. We are still growing, growing and we need help. You are a major part of that. Tell your friends. Tell your family. We are crime after crime. Thank you guys so much and have a happy new year. We will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Take care.